The Bell XV-3, or Bell 200, was an American tilt-rotor aircraft that Bell Helicopter produced to fulfill a request in the aftermath of the Korean War to develop converter planes for use in future military operations. The Bell 200 featured a unique airframe in which the engine was mounted in the fuselage with drive shafts that transferred power to the bladed rotors placed on the wingtips. The rotors could tilt 90 degrees to alternate between vertical and horizontal positions, allowing it to take off like a helicopter and fly at faster airspeeds like a standard fixed-wing warplane. Testing began in 1955, and strange occurrences threatened to get in the way of its true potential. Still, its design would become the pillar of future tilt-rotor vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Convertible Aircraft By the time World War II came to an end, there was no doubt about the future capabilities of military helicopters. This new type of aircraft was tested primarily by the United States during the 1944 campaign in Burma, but the Luftwaffe also experimented with a prototype that was destroyed by the Allied bombings late in the war. The Sikorsky R-4, designed by Russian immigrant Igor Sikorsky, demonstrated the helicopter's capabilities as a war asset for ground troops. Although not without its faults, the Sikorsky R-4 became essential for quickly transporting troops to the front lines and extracting wounded soldiers from the battlefield. It also became an essential tool for the primitive special forces that operated behind enemy lines and were employed by both the Americans and British to wage war against the Japanese. The tactics for which the helicopter was used would be perfected two decades later, at the outbreak of the Vietnam War in 1965. However, the United States made slow progress towards perfecting this promising machine. Although the helicopter could take off vertically, it had a limited top speed that made it noticeably slower than standard fixed-wing aircraft. The aircraft wasn't able to counteract the roll at a higher rate that resulted from the rotor advancing into the airflow on one side while retreating from the other. In the book Straight Up, A History of Vertical Flight, authors S. Muxman and B. Holder write, quote, One attempt to counter this phenomenon was the compound helicopter that used small wings to pick up the flight loads as forward speed increased. This reduced the loading on the rotor, and thus the rolling tendency at higher speeds. An alternate solution was the tilt rotor. The tilt rotor came out of a necessity to merge the benefits of a helicopter with those of a fixed-wing aircraft. It could take off vertically while also flying horizontally at faster airspeeds by tilting the rotor forward to serve as a propeller. Bell Helicopter, a division of Bell Aircraft Company, believed the tilt rotor configuration was the future of aircraft. The Bell 200 Experiment in 1951, the Army and Air Force announced an official tilt-rotor design competition under the Convertible Aircraft Program. The request for a proposal called for a converter plane with the VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, of a helicopter and the high speeds of a conventional fixed-wing aircraft. Bell's Model 200 design prevailed and was awarded a contract in May of 1951. The concept was codenamed XV-3 by the Army and Air Force. Two prototypes would be built with tail numbers 4147 and 4148. Development was divided into two phases. Phase 1 consisted of analyzing the VTOL capabilities and possible engineering obstacles. Phase 2 would be the production of the prototypes. The first mock-up of the Bell Model 200 converter plane, a wind tunnel model, was finished in June of 1952, but the first prototype would not be completed until 1955. According to Marksman and Holder, the Model 200's configuration consisted of, quote, a metal fuselage with the slender metal wing mounted mid-fuselage. A large helicopter-like rotor was mounted on each wingtip. The rotor shafts were oriented in a vertical position for takeoff, landing, and hover like a helicopter, and moved to the horizontal position for forward flight like a conventional aircraft. A single Pratt & Whitney R-985 AN-1 Wasp Jr. piston engine, producing 400 horsepower for flight and 450 horsepower for takeoff, was located in the fuselage just behind the wing. A series of gearboxes and drive shafts transferred power to the rotors. Fuel was stored in a 380-liter tank located in the fuselage just under the wing. The fuselage length was 30 feet, the wingspan was 31 feet, the height was 13 feet, and the wing area was 116 feet. The maximum speed was estimated to be 170 miles per hour. The first prototype included three-bladed, completely articulated 7.63 diameter rotors that would be changed in the second prototype with two-bladed rotors. The rotors were powered through a two-speed transmission that could be shifted to a lower gear that allowed them to turn horizontally at a lower speed. At the same time, the engine maintained a higher speed for cruise effectiveness. If the engine failed, the rotors could be manually turned to a vertical position for a standard helicopter landing. An electric motor located at each wingtip 
triggered the rotor tilt. Each rotor could rotate at a 90 degree angle and they could either reach vertical or horizontal positions in less than 15 seconds. The pilot could also stop the rotor motion at any point, a breakthrough for the time. The Air Force wanted to use the Model 200 for reconnaissance, observation, and medical operations on the battlefield. For that reason, it was to be equipped with two litters for wounded men, room for two or three passengers, and up to 200 pounds worth of cargo. First prototype. The wind tunnel model performed well. Stability and control mechanics were excellent, and the only aspect that remained to be tested was the impact of rotor transition at cruise speeds. The first prototype of the Model 200, number 4147, flew for the first time on August 11, 1955, by Bell Chief Test Pilot Floyd Carlson. During the flight, several problems arose regarding wing, rotor, and pylon instabilities. Additionally, the cockpit vibrated extensively whenever the Bell 200 hovered. As the engine was underpowered, Bell's engineers decided early in production to compensate for this by building a lighter airframe. On August 18th, the Bell 200 suffered a hard landing when the rotor failed. The aircraft was then grounded for repairs and more internal testing. The rotor controls were hardened, and external supports were added to make the wings more rigid. Other modifications were made to reduce stall speed and thus permit transitions at lower rates. The Bell 200 took to the skies again on March 24, 1956 for more testing. Progress was made, and in early June, Bell commenced testing a gradual rotor tilt by 5 degrees. By July 25th, rotor tilt reached 70 degrees and 93 miles per hour forward speed. Still, more rotor instability problems arose, and the prototype was grounded for a second time. During a test in October, a rotor instability arose mid-flight. The vibrations were so severe that the test pilot, Dick Stansbury, blacked out, and the prototype crashed. Stansbury survived, but suffered significant injuries, while the prototype was damaged beyond repair. The accident occurred when the rotors were moved 17 degrees forward from a vertical position. As a consequence, Bell decided to heavily modify the second prototype in 1957 before proceeding. Second Prototype The second prototype was shipped to Ames Aeronautical Laboratory under the control of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA. The three-bladed rotors had been replaced with two-bladed ones, and the cooling air inlets were also replaced. Tests at the Ames Wind Tunnel facility began in July of 1957, and flight tests followed in January of 1958. The Model 200 now reached a top speed of 127 miles per hour with a 30-degree rotation. On December 18, 1958, Bell test pilot Bill Quinlan achieved the first dynamically stable full conversion to airplane mode. A month later, Air Force Captain Robert Ferry became the first military pilot to complete a second full conversion. And in April of 1959, the second prototype was sent to Edwards Air Force Base for military testing. After several evaluations, the XV-3 was approved and sent back to Ames. It was then flown by NASA test pilot Fred Drinkwater. Full conversion to airplane mode was achieved multiple times, but failures continued to appear from time to time. In August of 1961, Army Major E. Kluver became the first Army pilot to fly the aircraft. Testing would continue through 1963 to solve the rotor instability issues. The second prototype was last flown that year. From then on, only wind tunnel models would be used. Overall, it was flown 270 times by 11 different pilots, and over 110 full conversions were achieved. Restoration By April of 1966, Bell analysts published a report explaining the rotor instability issues. During one of the many wind tunnel tests carried out by Bell and NASA, the Model 200 suffered a wingtip failure that extended to the rotors and damaged the aircraft and the wind tunnel. After this last failure, the aircraft's career ended, and it was placed in storage for many years. But in 1984, the XV-3 was rediscovered and restored. The restoration was slow and tedious, but the Model 200 was finally delivered to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in June of 2007. It's displayed today in its post-Cold War section. Numerous concepts learned from the Bell Model 200 would become essential for developing the Bell XV-15, which would pave the way for the V-22 Osprey, a tilt-rotor aircraft that the U.S. Armed Forces still use to this day. If you enjoyed our video, please like it, and subscribe to our channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below about other topics of your interest, such as legendary aircraft or epic air battles.